This video, the third, looks at episodes of Star Trek, in this case episodes 13 to 17, of the original series or generation to identify historical references which can be used to determine the original history of the Star Trek universe. Special thanks to the transcripts which can be found on the Shikate site. The order episode, or the episode order, is the production order. In order to understand the development of the history or vision, we need to study the episodes in the order they were written. While I'm uncertain of the exact writing order, the production order is about as close as I can get. When Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek back in 1966, he had a vision which remained basically consistent over the following three years. The animated series and early movies retained this consistency in the most part. When The Next Generation was released in 1987, Gene's vision had changed and the past needed to change in order to be consistent with this new vision. This video series will look at the original vision of Star Trek, starting with the earlier source material. Any historical facts from later sources which contradict the earlier references must be assumed to be an error. Minor changes in nomenclature can be excused. The Conscience of the King is the 13th episode of the first season. It was the 13th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation, Starfleet or Photon Torpedoes in this episode. The Enterprise is called a Starship and also the USS Enterprise. Kirk mentions there is a shuttlecraft on the Enterprise, but we do not get to see it. This is the first time a shuttle is mentioned. Kirk states, this is the observation deck. That's the flight deck down there with the shuttlecraft. Sygena Minor is a Earth colony. The Enterprise travels to another planet. It's assumed, assumed to be another Earth planet, but we are not given its name. Captain's Log, Stardate 2817.6. Starship Enterprise are diverted from scheduled course purpose to confirm discovery by Dr. Thomas Lighton of an extraordinary new synth synthetic food which would totally end the threat of famine on Sygena Minor, a nearby Earth colony. We're told the name of another Earth colony, in this case, Tarsus IV. 24 years previously, the colony suffered a famine. Kirk states, history file, subject, former Governor Kodos of Tarsus IV, also known as Kodos the Executioner. After that, background on actor Anton Caridian. Computer replies, working, Kodos the Executioner, summary, Governor of Tarsus IV, 20 Earth years ago, invoked martial law, slaughtered 50% of population of Earth colony, that planet. Burned body found when Earth forces arrived. No positive identification. Case closed. Detailed information follows on Stardate 2794.7. Later, Spock states, I will continue, Doctor. According to our library files, it start started on the Earth colony of Tarsus IV when the food supply was attacked by an exotic fungus and largely destroyed. There were over 8,000 colonists and virtually no food. And that was when Governor Kodos seized full power and declared emergency martial law. The Astral Queen is a spaceship which was supposed to pick up the theatre company. It seems to be a part of some form of schedule and looked like a passenger suit ship, but no details are provided. Kirk states, put me through to Captain John Daly of the Astral Queen on orbit station and put it on scramble. We're told the name of another Earth colony, in this case, a Benicia colony. Kirk states, Benicia colony. Spock replies, Benicia colony is eight light years off our course. Later, Kirk asks, Mr. Spock, ETA, the Benicia colony. Spock replies, we'll arrive at Stardate 2825.3, Captain, approximately 1500 Benicia time. We're getting a lot of planets in this episode. The uh, Caridian Company was on Planet Q, where Dr. Leighton Lighton was murdered. Dr. Lighton is human and assumed the Carid Cardidian Company was performing for humans. Thus, it must be an Earth planet. It's possibly it was not a colony. Spock states, Logic, Captain. Dr. Lighton was murdered while the Cardidian Company was on Planet Q. Now an attempt has been made against Riley while the company is on board the Enterprise. In conclusion, uh, the biggest piece of information in this episode is the existence of the shuttle, although we do not see it. There is a high probability there is a passenger service between Earth planets. A further three Earth colony planets are identified, one other Earth planet and a fifth unnamed Earth planet. Assuming this is the first year of the five-year mission of the Enterprise, then it's 2264. This means the famine on Tarsus V occurred in 2240. 
The Galileo 7 is the 16th episode of the first, first season. It was the 14th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation, Starfleet or Photon Torpedoes in this episode. We discover that there is a position of Galactic High Commissioner which has some level of authority over the Enterprise, clearly not part of what will become Starfleet, but some kind of civilian authority. Captain's Log, Stardate 2821.5, en route to Makers 3 with a cargo of medical supply. Our course leads us past Mura Murasanki 312, a quasar-like formation, vague, un unidentified, a priceless opportunity for scientific investigation. On board is Galactic High Commissioner Ferris, overseeing the delivery of the medicines to Makers 3. Makers 3 is a location from which some form of transfer will occur to a colony planet. Makers 3 must be part of an Earth Federation, most likely human, but this is not specifically stated. It's likely to not be a colony, so it could be a non-human member of the Earth Federation. Captain's Log, Stardate 2821.5. On board is Galactic High Commissioner Ferris, overseeing the delivery of the medicines to Makers 3. Ferris states, I remind you, Captain, I'm entirely opposed to this delay. Your mission is to get these emergency supplies to Makers 3 in time for the transfer to the new Paris colonies. Kirk replies, No problem, Commissioner. And may I remind you that I have standing orders to investigate all quasar and quasar-like phenomena which may be encountered. Besides, it's three days to Makers, and the rendezvous doesn't take place for five. Ferris states, I was opposed to this from the beginning. Our flight to Makers 3 is of the very highest priority. The New Paris colonies are clearly Earth colonies, although it's possible they are not human colonies. On the other hand, why would a human call a planet a colony unless it was an Earth colony? And also, why would aliens call it a Paris colony? There must be more than one colony, possibly more than one colony planet, or multiple colonies on a single planet. That's not defined. Ferris states, your mission is to get those emergency medical supplies to Makers 3 in time for their transfer to the New Paris colonies. I don't like to take chances. The plague is out of control on New Paris. We must get those drugs there on time. Later, Ferris states, So are the plague victims on New Paris? I'm sorry, Captain. I now assume authority granted me under Title 15 Galactic Emergency Procedures, and I order you to abandon search. We finally get to see a shuttle. In this case, Shuttlecraft Class Galileo. Kirk states, Captain to Shuttle Class... Shuttlecraft Galileo, stand by Mr. Spock. Taurus 2 is a planet capable of sustaining human life. It's not controlled by the Federation as in, and is inhabited by an alien race. It's likely to be within the Earth Federation's border. Uhuru states, Captain, there's one planet in this solar system capable of sustaining human life. It's Type M, Oxygen, Nitrogen, and it's listed as Taurus 2. It's unexplored. As far as we can determine with our equipment, malfunction. It's about dead centre of the Muratsky effect. We learn the Enterprise is equipped with a second shuttlecraft, in this case, shuttlecraft Columbus. This must be the maximum complement, otherwise Kirk would have sent more shuttlecraft out. Kirk states, thank you. This is the captain speaking. Flight deck, prepare Columbus for immediate exit for a search of the planet's surface. Cor correlate coordinates with Mr. Sulu. Thank you. Anything, Uhuru? Launch Shuttlecraft Columbus. Later, Uhuru states, Captain, the Columbus has returned from searching quadrant 779X by 534M. Negative results. Kirk replies, Uhuru, order the Columbus to open its course two degrees on every lap from now on. We have another planet mentioned, although we never actually see it. It's called Hansen's Planet, which is also inhabited by aliens. Kellowitz states, We were attacked, Captain. Huge, furry creatures. I checked with astral anthropology and their, fro and their order 480G anthropo anthropods, similar to life forms discovered on Hansen's planet, but much larger, 10, 12 feet in height. We finally see the shuttle, two to be exact. We discover two planets which are inhabited by primitive aliens. One is within the human sphere and the second is most likely as well. One has no human settlements and it's likely human settlements do not exist on the other planet. 
Some form of civilian authority in the guise of the Galactic High Commissioner is mentioned. The significance of this is the Enterprise is not directly under the command of a civilian authority, although the civilian authority has indirect control. It's highly likely that the Enterprise is part of a military organisation. While this is clear in the original series, in the next generation the Enterprise seems to be more civilian than military in many areas. Court Martial is the 20th episode of the first season. It was the 15th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation or photon torpedoes in this episode. The Enterprise is called a starship and also USS Enterprise. This is the first mention of a starbase, in this case Starbase 11. It's assumed there is a Starbase 1 to 10. The Starbase has the ability to make repairs to starships. It's also assumed they order a planet, possibly inhabited based on the image from this episode. As the Starbase is clearly an Earth Starbase, any planet must be an Earth planet. Captain's Log, Stardate 2947.3. We have been through a severe ion storm. One crewman is dead. Ship's damage is considerable. I have ordered a non-scheduled layover on Starbase 11 for repairs. A full, repair of, a full report of damages was made to the commanding officer of Starbase 11, Commander Stone. Later, Captain's Log, Stardate 2948.5. Starship Enterprise remains in order, orbit around Starbase 11. Full repairs in progress. I've been ordered to stand by on Starbase 11 until the inquiry into the death of Lieutenant Commander Finley can be conducted. I'm confident of the outcome. Later, Captain's Log, Stardate 2948.9. The officer who was, will comprise my court-martial boards are proceeding to Starbase 11. Meanwhile, repairs on the Enterprise are almost complete. There is another starship at Starbase 11, called the Intrepid. Clearly the Enterprise is more important, so this other starship may be a smaller warship, or even a civilian ship. In the updated images from the episode, it looks like another starship like the Enterprise. The Starbase can only work on one starship at a time. Stone states, Maintenance Section 11. This section is working on the Intrepid. Rescheduled. The Enterprise is on Priority 1. That makes three times you've read it, Jim. Is there an error? This episode mentions a Vulcanian expedition, which Kirk may have been involved with. If he was 21, the year may be 2247. Could this be the expedition which makes first contact with the Vulcans? This is pure guesswork, and the fact Spock is half human indicates there must have been Earth-Vulcan contact before the Vulcanian expedition. Most likely it was the first Earth expedition to Vulcan, but that the Vulcans had made contact with Earth before Spock was born. It seems reasonable the Vulcans were in close contact with Earth well before Spock was born, to allow Spock's father to meet an Earth woman and marry her. Kirk states, Timothy, I haven't seen you since the Vulcanian expedition. He gets no reply. Well, I see our graduating class from the academy is well represented. Corrigan, Teller, how, uh, how are you doing, Mike? We get our very first mention of Starfleet. Computer, Spock, serial number, S179-276SP, service rank, Lieutenant, Commander, Position, First Officer, Science Officer, Current Assignment, USS Enterprise, Commendation, Vulcanian Scientific Legion of Honor, Award of Valor, twice decorated by Starfleet Command. We get additional detail about Spock. He has been decorated by Vulcan twice and by Starfleet twice. We also have the pure logic of the Vulcan's rays, and the fact Spock is half Vulcan. Computer, Spock, serial number S179-276SP, service rank, lieutenant, commander, position, first officer, science officer, current assignment, USS Enterprise, commendation, Vulcanian Scientific Legion of Honor, award of valor, twice decorated by Starfleet Command. Later, Spock states, Lieutenant, I am half Vulcanian. Vulcanians do not speculate. I speak from pure logic. If I let go of a hammer on a planet that has a positive gravity, I need not see it fall to know that it is it has in fact fallen. We get some more details about McCoy. He has been decorated three times, once by Starfleet surgeons. Shaw states, I now call Dr. McCoy to the stand. Computer, service rank, lieutenant commander, position, ship surgeon, current assignment, USS Enterprise, commendation, legion of honor, award of valor, Decorated by Starfleet Surgeons. 
This episode is the first where Kirk uses T as his middle name. We do not know what the name was, but we now know his name is T. Kirk, and he has won a lot of decorations. Computer, James T. Kirk, serial number SC937-017-6 CEC, service rank, captain, position, starship command, current assignment, USS Enterprise, commendations, palm leaf of Axanar, peace mission, grand kite, order of tactics, class of excellence, Prometheus Ribbon of Commendation, Glasses First and Second, Award of Valor, Medal of Honor, Silver Palm with Cluster, Starfleet Citation for Conspicuous Gallantry, Carrigan Order of Heroism. We discover in this episode there's something called the Fundamental Declaration of the Martian Colonies, which implies there are Martian colonies. This implies that Mars was colonized by Earth and has a status which allows it to have colonies. These colonies are, most likely, in other systems. It's possible these colonies were in the asteroid belts or the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but that is unlikely that these would have been colonised by Earth well before Mars had the ability to colonise anything. Kogli states, I'll be delighted to, sir, now that I've got something human to talk about. Rights, sir, human rights, the Bible, the Code of Hammurabi and of Justinian, Magna Carta, and the Constitution of the United States, Fundamental Declaration of the Martian Colonies, the Statue of Alpha III. We discovered there's something called the Statutes of Alpha III. It's possible this was a planet at Alpha Centauri, in this case a planet three. We know there are about five Alpha colonies, and as Alpha Centauri is a binary or even trinary system, it's very possible that there are actually five habitable colonies in this entire system. Whether Alpha 3 is a colony or an independent system in the Earth Federation is unknown, but I would suggest that if they're having some sort of legal code on the same status as the Magna Carta or the Constitution of the United States, that Alpha 3 is almost certainly some form of non-colony, Earth almost certainly. Clogie states, I'll be delighted to, sir, now that I've got something human to talk about. Rights, sir, human rights, the Bible, the Code of Hammurabi and of Justinian, Magna Carta, the Constitution of the United States, Fundamental Declaration of the Martian Colonies, the Statutes of Alpha III. In conclusion, we learn quite a bit from this episode. The Earth Federation has at least 11 star bases, if not more. They are clearly designed to provide repairs and maintenance for Earth starships, and almost certainly consist of an entire planet habitable by the looks of it. We are provided the name of a starship, or another starship, in this case Intrepid. While less important than the Enterprise, this does sound like the name of a warship. Earth sent an expedition to Vulcan sometime before Kirk assumed command of the Enterprise. We are uncertain what it was for, but it is possible this was the first Terran or Earth expedition to the planet Vulcan. We first hear of Starfleet, which controls the Enterprise and the Starbases. We discover that it's almost certain that Mars was powerful and independent enough to have its own colonies. It's possible Alpha 3 is the most powerful planet in the Alpha Centauri system, of which up to five planets may be colonised. This represents a lot of population and a lot of power. While this is total speculation, Mars was colonised and became powerful enough to have its own colonies. It would take at least a hundred years, if not much longer, for a planet to be terraformed and colonised to the point where it could send out colonies of its own. As it's currently 2266, it's possible the colonisation of Mars must have started by 2166, if not earlier, as Mars would have created Uh, its colonies well before 2266, it's likely the colonisation of Mars occurred well before 2166, perhaps before warp was invented in 2060. The first federation may well have been between Earth and Mars, although uh, this was still called Earth as everyone was human and descendants of Earth. Alpha 3 is also interesting as the context of this reference is describing a legal system It implies Alpha 3 was not a colony and was instead autonomous. If this speculation is correct, the colonisation of Alpha Centauri probably occurred well before warp was invented. This reinforces the idea that early impulse power or drive provided faster than light speeds. 
Back in 1960, I guess may have thought the solar system would have been colonised well before 2060 and that some exploration of the closer system may have occurred before warp was invented. Of course, subsequently that didn't occur, but my personal theory is that the, um, the timeline or the universe that this version of Star Trek exists in is not our timeline. The Menagerie, part one, is the 11th episode of the first season. It was the 16th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation or photon torpedoes in this episode. The Enterprise is called the United Spaceship Enterprise. In this episode, we return to Starbase 11. It seems that Starbase is a whole planet and not just a simple base in space. In this case, this represents a planet dedicated as a military base. Similar to the Romans, where the Romans would create a fort and then possibly civilian activity would grow around it. Piper states, Welcome to Starbase 11, Captain. The commander's waiting to see you. He's curious why you suddenly changed course and came here. We know that Starbase 11 has a shuttle, in this case, Shuttlecraft 1. It's possible it has more than one shuttlecraft. The shuttlecraft is powered with ion engine power. Mendez states, Starbase Shuttlecraft 1 to Enterprise. Come in, please, Enterprise. Commander Mendez and Captain Kirk, if you read me, you are ordered to reply. Repeating it on all emergency frequencies, Jim. Computer replies, computed. Object is a Class F shuttlecraft. Duranium metal shell, ion engine power. We are introduced to the former captain of the Enterprise, Christopher Pike. He has been badly injured in an accident on an old Class J starship. Clearly the starships have a class nomenclature and the Enterprise is a more current starship. The Enterprise is supposed to be a constitutional class, so the naming convention may have changed or the J-class starship is a smaller, more numerous type. Harry Mudd had a Class J cargo ship, so that is a link or an indication that we're dealing with a fairly small sort of vehicle. Mendez states, inspection tour of cadet vessel, old Class J starship, one of the baffle plates ruptured. McCoy replies, the Delta rays. It's likely Pike was injured in the first year of the Enterprise mission, probably around 2254. We're told Spock served for 11 years, 4 months, 5 days under Pike. Kirk states, I took over the Enterprise from him. Spock served with him for several years. Spock replies, 11 years, 4 months, 5 days. We are reintroduced to Talos 4. Visiting it is forbidden and punishable by death, the only crime which warrants death penalty in the Federation. Kirk states, What every ship captain knows, Order General Order 7, no vessel under any condition, emergency or otherwise, is to visit Talos 4, Mendez, and to do so is the only death penalty left on our books. Only Fleet Command knows why. Not even this file explains that, unlocks the magnetic strip. But it does name the only Earth ship that ever visited the planet. Mendez replies, he's dead if he makes it to Talos 4. Why would he want to get Pike there? The command report states, Talos contained absolutely no practical benefits to mankind. Starfleet is mentioned in this episode, and the first mention of a something called a general order. We learn that there is only one crime which warrants the death penalty, which is visiting Talos 4. Captain's Log, Stardate 3.12.4. Despite our best efforts to disengage computers, the Enterprise is still locked on a heading for the mysterious planet Talos 4. Meanwhile, as required by Starfleet, General Orders, a preliminary hearing on Lieutenant Commander Spock is being con convened. And in all the years of my service, this is the most painful moment I have ever faced. Mendez states, And to do so is the only death penalty left on our books. Only Fleet Command knows why. Not even this file explains that. In conclusion, we discover that star bases have shuttlecraft, which have ion engine power. As the shuttlecraft was able to follow the Enterprise, it must have faster than light capability as well. So the term ion engine power is related to the power source only. It must have warp capability. It's confirmed that star bases actually represent entire planets which means there could be at least 11 planets within the Federation de dedicated as military bases, if not more. Clearly, there is facilities orbiting the planets which are used to repair the actual starships, but these are military planets colonised by military personnel and probably later by civilian. 
The Menagerie Part 2 is the 12th episode of the first season. It was the second part of the 16th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation or photon torpedoes in this episode. As we already know, or actually it's confirmed here, the Enterprise was the only Federation visit ship to visit Talos 4. Kirk thinks to himself, why? Why does Spock want to take to that forbidden world his former captain? Mutilated by the recent space disaster, now a shell of a man, unable to speak or move, the only answer Spock would give was on the hearing room screen. How Spock could do this, he refused to explain. But there before our eyes, actual images from 13 years ago of Captain Pike as he was when he commanded this vessel, of Spock in those days, and of how the Enterprise had become the first and only starship to visit Talos IV. They had received a distress signal from that planet and discovered there, still alive after many years, the survivors of a missing vessel, only to find it was all an illusion. No survivors, no encampment. It was all a trap set by a race of beings who could make a man believe he was seeing anything they wished him to see, and Captain Pike was gone, a prisoner for some unknown purpose. This episode provides additional information about the Orion slave girls. It seems they are not as passive and as submissive as the original episode or the first pilot episode depicted them. Kirk states, That's Vina again, as the green Orion slave girl. Mendez replies, They're like animals, vicious, seductive. They say no human male can resist them. In conclusion, the main significant piece of information shown in this episode was concerning the Orion slave girls, who apparently are like animals, vicious, seductive and impossible to resist. This places a different slant on the green-skinned slave girls. Instead of being passive, they are actually proactive and aggressive. Shore Leave is the 15th episode of the first season. It was the 17th episode produced. There is no mention of the Earth Federation or photon torpedoes in this episode. The Enterprise finds an Earth-like, uninhabited planet in the Omicron Delta region. The series often uses regions for systems, so I'm assuming this is a system. Kirk, Captain's Log, Stardate 3025, uh, point 3. We are orbiting an uninhabited planet in the Omicron Delta region, a planet remarkably like Earth, or how we remember Earth to be, park-like, beautiful, green flowers, trees, green lawns, quiet and restful, almost too good to be true. We discover the Enterprise is a crew of 430 people, including Kirk, 431. McCoy states, he needs it. You've got your problems, I've got mine. He's got ours plus his plus 430's 30 other people's. Where are you going? According to this episode, the Federation allows crews to take shore leave on an uninhabited and unexplored planet. They must be very far away from any Federation planet to allow such a thing. Sulu asks, do you think the captain will authorise shore leave here? McCoy states, depending on my report and that of the other scouting parties, you know you have to see this place to believe it. It's like something out of Alice in Wonderland. The captain has to come down. We discover that Kirk had a girlfriend called Ruth 15 years ago. That would place it at probably 2249. Kirk states, Ruth, Ruth. Ruth replies, Jim, darling, it's me, it's Ruth. Kirk states, Ruth, Ruth, how can it be you? How could you possibly be here? You haven't aged. It's been 15 years. This episode introduces the tricorder for the first time. This can analyse objects. Kirk states, tricorder. Sulu replies, still operating, sir. Spock and Sulu swap places, handing over the tricorder, and Spock states, this is not human skin tissue, Captain. It's more, it more closely resembles the cellular castings we use for wound repairs, much finer, of course. We finally discover the Enterprise has stumbled across an amusement park for a, or amusement planet for an advanced race. Although no details of the people who built this are provided, this is because humans would not understand, whatever that means. It's possible the original inhabitants left in, let's say, a million years ago or 900,000 years ago, based on, let's say, the inhabitants of the planet which held the Guardian forever. This is based on the animated series, as in this episode, it seems like the inhabitants are still around somewhere. However, if this is the case, why is there no one else on the planet? It's very likely the inhabitants are long gone, and this is just simply a mechanical amusement park planet that's been operating and self-maintaining all this time. Kirk states, amuse? What is, what, that's your word for what we've been through? Caretaker replies, but none of this is permanent. 
Here you have to only imagine your fondest wishes, either old ones you wish to relive or new ones, anything at all. Battle, fear, love, triumph, anything that pleases you can be made to happen. Spock states, the term is amusement park. We learn of a, another planet, Rigel 2 is mentioned. As the girls on the planet are human, this must be, yet again, another human planet. It may not be a colony when McCoy visited, however. McCoy, I was thinking about a little cabaret I know on Rival 2, and er, uh, there the, were these two girls in the chorus line, and well, here they are. Well, after all, I am on shore leave. In conclusion, we discover an uninhabited planet, and are given the name of another human inhabited planet, in this case Rigel 2. We know no Federation ship has ever visited before the Enterprise got there, and it's likely this is located beyond the Federation territory. It's possible no race of a similar level of development to the Federation have ever visited it, otherwise how could such a misunderstanding occur, as did occur. The planet itself is uninhabited and used to be an amusement park by used by a species so advanced humans would not understand them at their present level of development which probably means the Federation will need to advance significantly before they reveal themselves. It should be also noted, if these aliens are un, un understandable of humans, and yet this amusement park is completely understandable, it's probably likely a long time ago the aliens, you know, progressed or moved on from this kind of simple amusement, and we'll never see them again. Yeah. The Enterprise must have travelled far outside Earth territory in, allow, in order to allow shore leave on an unexplored planet. We discover the Enterprise is a crew of 431, which is not much. A World War II German-like cruiser would typically have a crew of between 600 and 700. This makes me think that the Enterprise is not a capital ship and is instead something closer to a cruiser, which makes sense considering the mission it was on. Of course, later it was clearly identified as a capital ship, so clearly, with modern technology, you don't need thousands of people to crew your capital ships. Kirk had a girlfriend called Ruth 15 years ago, which he still has fond memories of. The tricorder is first mentioned in this episode. It has the ability to analyse an, an object to determine its composition. There is another race which built and used the planet in the Omicron Delta region as an amusement park. No details of the race are provided, and this confirms the Enterprise must be outside Earth-controlled space. Later in the animated series, the planet's creators are long gone, which makes a lot more sense than the, what we are told here. If this race is similar to the Guardian of Forever, they may have disappeared one million years ago, but this is purely a wild guess. The episode scripts I base this video on uh, are, can be found on the URL shown and also in the notes section. It becomes obvious that many of the latter Star Trek movies and shows do not align with the original vision of the series. This is common in real history as later historians attempt to change the past to justify their beliefs in the present. Live long and prosper.